This is the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, a podcast brought to you by two physical therapists devoted to helping physical therapists and other healthcare providers become better educators to patients, students, the community, and each other by interviewing prominent and passionate people within the realms of healthcare and education. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast is intended literally for educational and entertainment purposes only. No clinical decision making should be based on only one source, and therefore this podcast should not be used as personal medical advice. While care has been taken to ensure accuracy, occasionally mistakes and factual errors can be present, as we are only human. This is our journey on the road to becoming better educators, so get ready with your pen and paper as class is about to begin. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, F. Scott Feel, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Brandon Pone. And tonight, we have a special guest for you. We have Eric Christensen. Eric is the owner of Chandler Physical Therapy in Chandler, Arizona. For those of you who don't know Eric, he is a PT. He graduated with his doctorate of physical therapy um, from Regis University in 2009, where he published a journal article on the effect of whiplash on the cross-sectional area of the muscles surrounding the throat, uh, as well as presenting in multiple conferences. He graduated from Colorado State University with a degree in exercise science and a focus in sports medicine. In practice, Eric enjoys working with all populations of patients in the orthopedic and neurological field. He is specialized in custom orthotic prescription and casting, vestibular reprogramming, and manual therapy. When not at work, Eric enjoys reading, camping, hiking, skiing, and spending time with his family. Uh, Eric, I realize we kept your bio relatively brief, but is there anything else you would like the audience to know that we didn't mention about you already? Oh, no, you did a pretty good job. We're just got our own practice here in Chandler, Arizona, trying to do, you know, what we can for the field of physical therapy. Thank you guys so much for uh, letting me be part of this. No, thank you for coming on and talking with us today, especially with what you're going to be telling us. I'm excited to kind of hear what you're going to say. And and kind of a fun fact for our audience that actually one of my DPT classmates from where I went to school uh, actually now works with Erica Chandler Physical Therapy. And I want to give a personal shout out to the awesome uh, Jen Berwanger. I know right now she's celebrating her honeymoon. And if she ever listens to this, I'll say, Jen, congrats. I don't know if she'll hear that, but I thought I'd shout that in there. She definitely Um, will. Oh, there we go. So Eric, do you think you could kind of let our audience know a little bit about you know your academic journey and how it led you to where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I went to, like he said, Colorado State University as an undergrad and kind of left um, high school thinking I'd be interested in medicine and wanted to do something. Had tore my ACL and rehabbed that, so I kind of had my exposure to physical therapy that way and really found it interesting. I love the the manual contact, the hands-on contact, but also the time you got to spend with your patients. So I went to college thinking, you know, that'd be a, a kind of a cool path and kind of decided to jump in and kind of start that direction and we'll see where it goes from there. And the more I learned about it, the more I fell in love with it. I love that I, I didn't, you know, have to rely on the prescription of something or referring out to somebody else for the vast majority of what I was going to see. I love being able to spend time with my patients and and actually get to put my hands on and really develop those connections. So the more I learned about it, the more I loved it, um, jumped in full-fledged and decided this is where I wanted to go and got accepted to Regis and from there left and got to go. Yeah, Eric, you've written this book called Breathe Better, right? Could you tell us a little bit about what drove you to write this book? Yeah, you know, when I first started, you know, I've always been fascinated with the, the power of breathing and that it's one of the most internal things that we do, but it's also one of the things that can get screwed up the easiest. And so I deal with a, a fairly high amount of folks who have kind of a chronic pain syndrome or have been in you know, pain for an extremely long period of time. And so their breathing patterns have changed dramatically. Um, and I found that you know breathing was an easy way to access the nervous system and calm the nervous system down, but also kind of open the window to getting these patients to allowing us to do more than we'd normally be able to do. So I kind of started my interest. And the more I kind of worked with it in practice, I just saw the power of it. And it doesn't take any special skill. You just got to be kind of cute on it and be mindful of it. And so the more I learned about it, the more I decided, you know what, let's get a just kind of a quick little guidebook down for for the lay users so that people out there who are dealing with kind of this chronic issue might be able to open up, you know, their own world and get some pain relief. Love it, Eric. And actually, I must admit, I recommended the book to one of my patients this past week, and she read some of the stuff online. She absolutely loved it. So I give a shout out to you for that. And awesome. Thank you. No, anytime, no thank you for writing it. And, you know, Eric, 
kind of, I'm kind of curious here. Did you have any history or background with writing or was this kind of an instance where you saw a need and decided to fill it by putting your knowledge to the paper for the ben greater benefit of society? Yeah. You know, I never wrote a, a book per se. I've always enjoyed writing. Um, and if, if you read the book, it's, it's very informal. It's not, you know, scientific. And that's kind of my style. I, I write very similar to how I would talk, I feel. And and that's how I wanted that to carry over because I wanted people to feel open to it and, and feel like it was not this hard line thing, but something they could kind of make their own. Um, so I, I've had experience with writing, obviously, through different courses, but this is my first stab at actually writing a book. Yeah, and Eric, can can you go into a little bit of the process of writing the book? I mean, how long did it take you to go about publishing it? And, you know, did you research the whole process? Or, you know, what were your findings when you were going about writing it? <laughs> well, I don't know how many people do the, like, the learn the cold learning styles. Um, but I'm a converger, so I kind of jump first and then remember to look later. Um, so I kind of reverse engineered it. My I kind of knew what I wanted to write about. So I got all the content, or at least the general ideas, down and then got all that out and refined it later and kind of looked back and said, okay, now I have this, this content, what do I need to do to make it happen? Um, and so I, I would carve out you know, half an hour, hour in the morning every day, flesh out in that line, write on it, go back and edit it a little bit later, and then kind of decided to put it into a program where I could actually convert it to a book and then from there put it on Amazon. And all this was kind of, you know, for, through the Academy of Google to kind of figure out how to do that. Awesome. And Eric, how long did it take you to write the book entirely? The book, if I really carved out the time, it wouldn't take me too long, but it probably took me the course of about a year between when I had available time sitting down and, and carving out that time and not dealing with family stuff, business stuff, things like that. And this was all self-published? It was all self-published. Yes, sir. Nice, nice. So, Eric, kind of, you know, and of course, this book is obviously about breathing and such. And what would you say are some of the key take home message, messages we should be educating healthcare students and clinicians on? Um, and of course, as well as patients when it comes to breathing? I, I guess part from one of my causes, I think that every profession needs to be looking at breathing in some capacity, maybe not in terms of the whole scope of treatment. But you can change so much about, particularly in pain syndromes or, or myofascial or musculoskeletal pain issues, um, just through simply breathing. Um, it controls so much of the nervous system. And you can, you know, even can, like looking down at anxiety, possibly digestion, there's so many things that can be changed just through some simple habit changes. And I, that would be my goal is to say, hey, you know what, let's, let's get everybody educated on this because if there's literally no risk with it and everything you gain. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. I think it's a highly underutilized uh, tool. And, and speaking of which, um, Eric, I'd like to get your take on what do you feel DPT schools are doing as far as, as educating new grads on, on breathing? Do you think they're doing an adequate enough job on teaching the importance of breathing and technique? You know, that's a, at least they dabble in it, which is great. I, I think that it's tough to specialize in anything in PT school because they're training you to be safe and enter the world to be prepared to learn to be a great physical therapist. I would love to see a little bit more focus on it and possibly its implications through different, you know, spectrum of orthopedic, neuromuscular, you know, even neurologic disorders. Gotcha. And Eric, I'm kind of curious with you doing some research and writing the book and such. And, you know, compared to what we learned in DPT school, kind of regarding breathing and the cardiopulmonary aspects and the systems there, what did you really take away from doing this book? Like, did you learn anything new that kind of expanded on what you thought about breathing before and such? Or, you know, I'm just curious if what you learned from writing the book regarding breathing and kind of how that compared to what you learned before in school. Yeah, you know, when, when you look at what you learn in school, you learn certain techniques to kind of gain a result. This is going to help you breathe more through your diaphragm. This is going to help you, you know, maybe clear your lung on the left left side. Um, those sorts of things. Whereas when I'm kind of honing this book in, I'm looking at, okay, what's going to change as a result of that? You know, maybe we're going to get better left cervical rotation. And, and a lot of that sort of musculoskeletal stuff wasn't necessarily addressed outside of, oh, you might have more thoracic mobility. But, you know, even, okay, if I get the diaphragm turned on, suddenly my iliopsoas can actually relax and I might have a much different toe touch pattern 
simply because my body's neuromuscular system is primed a little different way. And that's something I, I would love everybody to take home from this book, but also something that I kind of even gained more appreciative insight into that is that, okay, you know, we can change presentations very, very quickly with very little effort if we apply it correctly. Yeah. And I think that's a really important point to make, especially the variance and the patterns there. I think that's very interesting. And, you know, Eric, I'm kind of curious overall, I know, as you said before, there's variance within breathing patterns and such. And I'm kind of curious from, you know, your research and your experience, um, what do you tend to educate people on, like either at a patient in terms of how to incorporate breathing or how to breathe better? A lot of the folks that I see are folks that come in in a very protective pattern, and a lot of them are what I would call an apical breathing pattern, upper chest breathing pattern. And they're taking little small sips of air. They're not getting a lot of uh, gas exchange out of there, and they're doing it predominantly through their upper chest using scalenes or their kind of neck muscles and levators and, you know, not using the diaphragm appropriately. And you know, that's a good survival strategy. We need that when we're trying to get away from danger is kind of the last round of defense. Um, but it shouldn't be how we're operating day to day. And so a lot of my time in the clinic is spent saying, okay, this is what's happening. This is the, you know, pattern you're going to see. You're going to see your neck get tight. You're going to possibly see your anxiety ramp up. You're going to have other issues that way. Like, and this is how you fix it. So it, that's kind of the bread and butter. Say, hey, let's let's get out of that apical breathing pattern. And once you can get folks to move a little bit better, you know, a magic happens and then you can kind of take advantage of that situation. Yeah, Eric, I, I've been looking forward to having you on the episode here for, for one main question in particular. Uh, tell me a little bit about broken ribs, right? Because I, I think that when I see that, I, I cringe right off the bat because A, it hurts like heck. And B, I really don't have much as far as treatment options in the bag. But I know deep breathing is definitely one of them, and that helps, right? So what are you doing with patients with broken ribs? Are you instructing them any special way as far as their breathing techniques? You, you know, it, with broken ribs, initially you want to look at, at pain control. And it depends on how acute or subacute they are. Because they are painful and, and they can't do a whole heck of a lot for them. Um, for me, independent of any sort of breathing kind of techniques, I'm going to make sure that we're doing any sort of inflammation and pain control techniques we can do, whether that's, you know, light cupping, maybe that's kinesio taping, just to kind of give that that feedback that is supported, which can help muscles around it relax. And once we're, you know, to a point where a person can breathe without just constantly being in pain, then I'm focusing on trying to guide that person to breathe into that area. And just as you would a painful joint that might be limited into, let's say your hip joints limited to extension, you may, may start with a grade two or a grade one mobilization. We're thinking the same thing with breathing. You're going to get your hands on it. Um, and you're just going to kind of focus with the patient and say, okay, you know, I want you to breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth. As you breathe in, you're going to focus on trying to direct air towards my hand. And once you kind of reach, let's say a three out of 10 for pain or whatever that person's appropriate threshold is, we're, we're stopping and we're going to let it breathe out and we're just going to kind of continue that cycle. And what you'll see is that kind of that natural rhythm, that natural mobilization will kind of be an analgesic and they'll start getting a little bit more. And then you repeat that frequently and have them practice that at home. Um, you'll see pain levels drop significantly. Yeah, Eric, I love those ideas of uh, tactile type stuff with the kinesio taping and, and, and the touching and having them breathe to your hand. That's definitely some good techniques that I definitely don't use enough. Um, just a, a kind of a flip question here. Instead of somebody who's injured or has an impairment, let's talk about maybe some of the higher level athletes um, that come in and, and are just looking to kind of gain, uh, you know, a, a competitive edge. Uh, how would you go about educating some of these high level athletes who are just looking to get better at their breathing techniques? Yeah. For someone who's, you know, extremely accomplished, you'd be surprised. These are, you know, physically adept people, but it doesn't mean they breathe any different than you or I. The system is the same. And when their system gets stressed, maybe it's at a much higher level than say Jane Doe, who's 85 and can't walk around the block. Um, but the protective patterns are the same. And a lot of times when we're seeing these athletes in injury, the, the techniques are mirror images of anything I would do for anyone who's in a protective pattern. For more of a like performance enhancement, 
what I like to do is really shift because these are folks that are really operating at the edge of their threshold. They're pushing it all the time. They don't need me to push it even more. They need me to teach them how to rest and relax and teach them how their body can recover because if their neurologic system is more versatile, if it can handle wider loads for a greater amount of time, that's going to behoove them more than any sort of physical adaptation. I can Sure. Make. No, those are some good points, Eric. And kind of even, I'm going to go get back down. I'm not going to go to the athlete route, but especially for those individuals that have um, cancer within the lungs, they've had part of their lungs removed and such, they kind of have kind of that, you know, reduced capacity overall in terms of with breathing and such. Have the strategies that you found to kind of help those people relatively the same overall, or is it different? I think the expectation of the amount of change you're going to get might have to change initially. But the cool thing is even if, if you have a lung removed, as long as you didn't remove any of the sports structures, take out the diaphragm, take out any scalenes, anything like that, the mechanisms to get air into that lung are the same. And so the human body is very good at going into very predictive patterns of defense when it's in pain, when it's in threatened, when it's overloaded. And, and the correction of those patterns are still the same. It's just you might not be able to take such a big breath in or with such little pain initially with someone who's maybe had part of their lung taken out versus Sure, and didn't. you know, I'm going to kind of switch gears here in terms of asking kind of a little bit more about kind of what the evidence says. And I'm kind of curious, Eric, in terms of the research and stuff that you've done, what does the evidence overall seem to say in terms of with the importance of breathing and these types of, and overall uh, breathing techniques and kind of management of symptoms and pain? The cool thing about breathing, I think the bottom line is, is that I don't think it's dangerous to do it all. And I think that if you're just practicing breathing, it may not be that golden ticket, but it's certainly not going to be dangerous to the patient. I think the evidence kind of states that right out of the gate. Um, there's a lot of good evidence to suggest about blood pressure or carbon dioxide within the blood and the implications of uh, what we call respiratory alkalosis, where you have um, too much CO2 in the blood and the ability even just slowing down, changing your breathing pattern to a belly breathing pattern, taking three to five breaths can change that significantly. And then understanding what if you change that, how that can implicate the neck muscles, anxiety, tension, that's pretty nice. well supported. And Eric, kind of I'm curious for you, how has writing this book and how do you feel that this book overall has impacted your clinical experience and your business experience? It's interesting because locally, you know, they're like, oh, you're the guy that kind of wrote the breathing book. I, yeah, I did. And we use breathing on a lot of people. And I think my, my current patient base already kind of knew that. Um, they've been amazing supporters of, of helping me out with kind of spreading the word about the book and, and downloading it. But it's also opened up a lot of opportunities for education because people are asking questions and, you know, particularly, okay, these are, you know, like this is the scalings and this is what's going to go wrong and this is what's going to correct it. And these are the issues you might see if this does go wrong. It, it's really generated a good conversation within the community and, and with people coming in or just calling and saying, hey, you know what? will this help? I saw this online and, you know, sometimes it does, sometimes it might not, but it, it definitely has helped in terms of generating awareness for the business. Yeah. Eric, uh, let's say you have a new grad or even an experienced clinician, um, and they're writing a book on a specific topic that they have. What do you feel is the overall impact, um, financially for them? Like is, is writing a book something that, you know, could be another stream of income for them? I mean, not their main source of income, but is it is it something that could be lucrative for them? In terms of, you know, income, definitely, at least from my experience now, it's definitely not going to substitute my income and I'm not going to be a full-time writer anytime soon. Um, I think from word of mouth and referrals, it definitely, that's a hard thing to track, but it's definitely well worth it. Um, and, it's, it's something that you can go to referral sources, um, trainers, doctors, whoever you're getting patients from and say, hey, this is something I wrote. This is something we do every day in my practice. Here you go. And, you know, people, I can't remember where I heard this from initially, but people will always, you know, they, they very rarely will throw away a book. They will very often throw away a business card. And so they may not read it right away, but it's kind of always there. And that kind of constant presence 
coupled with patient, you know, recommendations and feedback from patients that really steamrolls a practice. Um, and I do think that there, you can't put a price on that. That is definitely well worth it. Yeah, for sure. And I'm kind of curious, Eric, kind of too, because, you know, of course, with a book being more so those that prefer a reading style of learning, I'm curious for you, have, do you have the book that's currently available in audiobook format? And is that something, or if not, is that something you're looking to do to kind of perhaps get a wider audience whose method of learning or reading is primarily um, auditory? As far as an audio thing, I absolutely am looking into it. I attempted, I spent one weekend, we went camping in the mountains took my iPhone and my sweet little microphone and recorded it while my family was asleep at like four in the morning. Um, But unfortunately, my audio was a little bit too quiet. And when I tried to bump it up, it just didn't sound good. Um, So I am actually looking to uh, hire that out, you know, on an Upwork type thing or and and get it done. It's definitely in the works. It'll probably be done, hopefully before the beginning of the year. Well, that's awesome to hear, Eric. Uh, Thanks so much for your time and for coming on the show tonight. Uh, We like to end each episode by asking all of our guests one final question, and that's if you could change one aspect of healthcare education, DPT or otherwise, what aspect would you change and how would you change it? For me, I think it would be changing the expectation that you're going to be, you know, 100% ready to walk out of school and into the clinic and be exceptional at what you do. I think there's a lot of new grads out there that'll be like, wow, I don't know nearly enough as I thought I would, but changing the expectation that this is, you know, graduation from PT, PT school, and I'll use that as an example because I'm familiar with it, is really the start. And that's where you're going to get better from there. Um, I don't think that that's honed in enough, at least in my personal experience. And I would love to see that message passed along and have clinical education reflect that and really come down and say, okay, you're at this stage, this is where you go. And you're in your final clinical rotation. This is what you can, you know, expect going out. And this is, this is where you need to go from here and maybe even developing a game plan after that. Right. It's learning that you got a long ways to go, even when you're all done with school. And I think that's a true statement. And I think that was actually kind of funny that, you know, someone that I heard kind of went through their ideas of stages as clinical of development. So kind of starting with kind of the unconscious, incompetent phase, then kind of transitioning to the conscious incompetence phase, then going to the conscious competence phase. And I thought that was a pretty interesting way to say it. Yeah, absolutely. You don't know what you don't know, right? Yeah, no, that's totally true. And, you know, and Eric, thanks again so much for coming on the show today to talk with us all about aspects of breathing and such as I definitely took a few things away. Um, do you think you could tell our audience where they can pick up your book, Breathe Better, and where they can find you online and on social media? Absolutely. Um, first of all, thank you guys for having me. It's been awesome. It's been an honor. and I've been looking forward to doing this for a really long time. So thank you for taking the time. As far as the book, uh, the ebook version is on Amazon. Just type in Breathe Better and, you know, sometimes you have to type in my last name, but it pops right up. Otherwise, you might get some nasal strips. Um, and then as far as my online profiles, I am uh, at Chandler underscore PT on Twitter for my business account. I'm at Eric underscore S underscore Christensen as my personal account. And we're on Facebook as Chandler Physical Therapy. And I'm also on Instagram under the same thing, Chandler Physical Therapy. Awesome. And for those of our listeners who are looking in the podcast show notes, we will actually post the link um, to the book through Amazon there, along with the links that Eric provided there. So you guys won't have to necessarily type all that in as he says. You can just go to our show notes, click the links and kind of go from there. But, you know, like again, Eric, thanks so much for coming on, man. Always a pleasure. Awesome, you guys. Thank you so much. Have a great night. You too, man. You too. Thank you for attending class today, and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, healthcareeducationtransformationpodcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.